Welcome to Business Done Differently, where baseball team owner turned showman Jesse Cole speaks with successful entrepreneurs who stand out in business and in life by thinking differently and challenging the status quo. We believe whatever is normal, do the exact opposite, and that normal gets normal results. If you want to stand out and be different, this one's for you. Today's guest is known throughout the marketing world. He is on a marketing rebellion. He was born to blog and from a young age understood the content code and the Tao of Twitter. He is now sharing the secrets on the world stages and on a crusade to let the world know that the most human company wins. I am fired up to introduce the one, the only, the marketing man himself, Mark Schaefer. Oh, I am fired up to be here with you. That was a great intro. <laughs> <laughs> I had fun writing. I never thought I could write like a whole intro with just book titles, but you gave me a lot of content. Yeah, I think you pretty much got them all. <laughs> I think I did. There'll be more to come, I'm sure. Fired up about to meeting you, read your book. I was like, this is it. This is the future of marketing, marketing oh, rebellion. thank you. And the customers are your marketers. And so many people don't understand that. Please just kind of give the onset and opening to the audience to understand how you came across this realization and what is the future of marketing? Well, that's a great question. So I've been in marketing more than 30 years and I started my career with big companies and then started to get into consulting and social media. So, I mean, I've been around quite a lot. <laughs> and over the last couple of years, everyone I was talking to, big companies and small companies were just saying they were feeling sort of stuck, that things weren't working like they used to that they were feeling overwhelmed, they were falling behind. So I had a hypothesis that it was because of technology, that everybody's kind of overwhelmed, like what's the next big thing, AI and blockchain and all this. And, but when I got into it, Jesse, I realized that, sure, I mean, the technology is moving ahead of us, but that really the customers are moving ahead of us. The customers are in control now. And most people who grew up in business, like me, we're sort of oriented toward a model where we have the marketing messaging. We have our personas and our highly crafted messages and that we will share these messages that will result in a sales funnel. And last year as I was researching for this new book, Marketing Rebellion, I was immersed in this research. And I literally got to a point where I just sort of lost my breath and realized I don't know what it means to be a marketer anymore because all those things I just talked about are gone. And two-thirds of our marketing is occurring without us. So it's through word-of-mouth marketing. It's through social media. It's through listening to influencers. It's reading reviews. Those are the things that are moving our story along. And the cataclysmic change that has occurred is that most people are still operating under this idea is that a brand is what a company communicates to you. But the reality of our world is a brand today is what people tell each other. So we have to flip this mindset and think about how do we get invited into those conversations and can't buy our way in like the old days. How do we create excitement? How do we create these stories so our customers become the marketers and carry the stories forward. It's such a brilliant idea and concept, but the problem is, Mark, that everyone is spending millions and billions of dollars on marketing, but they're not spending even a percentage point of that money on the experience. And if your customers are marketing, are the marketers, why don't you go all in? And we, at a small level, realize that like we don't have a marketing budget. Mark, we don't even have a full-time marketing director. <laughs> but we have a director of first impressions, a fan's first director, a ticket experience coordinator. And so why aren't companies getting it? Is it just, is the learning curve too much? Well, it's complicated. It really is complicated. The number one obstacle, I think, is culture. So here's what is exciting to me. We've got new people coming into the world, new people coming into business like you, young people who are digital natives. They understand how business works. And you look at the stuff we used to do in the old days, and you'd think, who would ever do that? That's just stupid. Why would you annoy people like that? So number one is I am totally excited by the change that's happening, but it's not happening 
at the companies we know and love. Mm. It's happening with the new energy, the digital natives coming on board and leading their own companies. Number two, I think, is measurement. So in your business with the bananas, you've got someone who's in charge of the experience waiting in line and someone waiting, buying the tickets and during the game. Everybody's sort of looking at this experience. But how does that impact sales on a day-to-day basis? It's almost impossible to measure. You sort of have to take a leap of faith and say, if we trust our customers to be the marketers, it's going to work. And that's very, very difficult for most businesses to accept. I had an amazing experience, Jesse. When I was in graduate school, I got to study under Peter Drucker. He was one of the most, he's probably the most celebrated and acclaimed management consultant and author in the history of the world. I studied under him for three years. And one of the things he pounded into my head, and one of his most famous sayings is, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Now, that's the way the world's grown up in business. Yes. So this is a big cultural shift to be able to take a leap of faith and say, well, it's virtually impossible to measure a lot of this experiential marketing. Mm. You'd go crazy trying to measure it. So you need to take risks. You need to sort of think about, if this works, what would it sort of look like? What do we think it would look like? And then if it sort of looks like that, then you do a little more. Mm. So you've got to stop, start moving in that direction. So I think culture is a big obstacle. Measurement is a big obstacle. And I think just an aversion to risk is a big obstacle. But it is happening. Yes, it is. It is. And especially the, the smaller companies. It's absolutely happening because here's the deal. We don't have a choice. <laughs> we don't have a choice. Yeah. People don't see our ads anymore. And if they see them, they don't believe them anyway. 100%. So we've got to trust the customers to be the marketers, and we've got to be down there with them, creating experiences that they love, that they love so much that they'll share it with all their friends. It's so true, Mark, because companies are going to start going out of business. They already are. I mean, even these big ones that dominated Blockbuster, they weren't focused on the experience. They were focused on those the late fees and focused on how to maximize the dollars. I think the problem, Mark, when you're saying it, it's like so many people are focused on short-term profits and not the long-term values of their brand. I find it's interesting, in your talk, you said one of the most powerful statements, stop doing what customers hate. Yeah, that was surprising to me. You're referring to the talk I gave at Social Media Marketing World, and here's what people, they were like cheering for that in the middle of my speech for that statement. So I think the reason why that resonates with people, because a lot of marketers forget that we're customers first. Just remember what it's like to be a customer. And if you're doing stuff in your business that people hate, stop it. Just stop it. That's I talk about the human-centered approach to marketing, the human-centered approach to business. That's step number one. Just stop doing what people hate. Let's get over that hurdle. And then get out there and talk to your customers and spend time with them and figure out what do our customers love and we're obsessed with technology, and we're hiding behind dashboards, and we think all this wisdom is going to come through some social media monitoring system, and it isn't. We have to get out there, and we have to talk to our customers. You know, all those basic human needs and human truths that I talk about in my book, we need to reconnect with people on a human basis and get out of our dashboards. I think that's so true, and I think that's a great segue to get into the five constant human truths. It's very simple when you think about it, No one wakes up in the morning and says, you know what? I want to be marketed to today. I want to be (laughs) advertised to today. You know what? I hope someone calls me and sells me something today. (laughs) No one wakes up that day. So then why do we come in and have our marketing meeting, our sales meeting, and our advertising meeting? Why don't we just say, hey, what are we doing to wow, surprise, and delight and create amazing experience today? Again, we had to fail to realize this. My wife and I were on an airbed. We were struggling. But like, we started to ask, like, How do we make people feel? How do you design the customer emotion? That is what fans first is. And I think that goes directly, Mark, into the five constant human truths that you talk about in your book. And I think we can lead into this to talk into some of the practical examples. Sure. And yeah, it's a great example. I mean, I think you're really a great role model today in terms of 
tapping into what people need today. And I talk about in the book how the example that sort of got me thinking about these things that don't change, the constant human truths, was this quote from Jeff Bezos, who, you know, everybody would point to him as a great technological disruptor. And he said, no, he said, we have a lot of technology. He said, but we focus on these human truths that aren't going to change. People want a low price, fast selection, and fast delivery. It's impossible for me to think that will ever change. So if we just do that better and better and better and better and better and put the technology in the service of those human truths, we'll win. So in the world, you know, look, business can be really intimidating. It can be really overwhelming. But I think if you focus on these constant human truths that don't change, then you can kind of calm down and say, look, that's what our business is all about. And I like the way you expressed it, the long-term value to your customer, right? It's something that they can count on. It's something that they can rely on. It's something that's appealing. Entertainment. People are always going to want to be entertained. It's impossible to think that they're not going to want to be entertained. Every business it, is the entertainment business. They are. I talk about that in my college classes that I teach. And you know, how many businesses today are sitting around thinking, how can we be more entertaining today? Yes. And yet that's the stories that spread. Just think about what everyone likes to share on social media. There's some element of entertainment to it. It meant something to us. There was research that was done a few years ago by BuzzSumo, which is an awesome company, by the way. And they said that the most associated word with content that goes viral is awe, A-W-E. Ooh. It's something that makes you go, wow, like I never saw that or I never thought about that or this is something that's going to amaze my friends. So it's like almost like the highest level of entertainment. There was a story that I left out of my book. Hmm. I actually put it in the workbook because it's a great story. Yeah. Cirque du Soleil is trying to measure awe. They are actually hooking up customers and measuring brainwaves to see what elements of the show create awe so that they can make better and better and better and better shows because that is the word that's going to make that's going to make it spread you probably know that by instinct when you create an experience for your customers that make them go wow never seen that before like getting a rose in the stands or something like that right that's awe that makes businesses thrive. Mm. And I think these conversations, you know, to start about the practical steps, we need to have these conversations. What are we doing to create these stories? And again, you don't have to spend a lot of money. I'll give you a great example. Like we just made a deal with a mobile car wash. And during the games, when people are watching the games, they're going to pick out a few cars and completely wash their car, have a thank you note for coming to the game. And people are just going to go to their car. We're not going to announce it. We're not going to make a big deal. But if you come to your car afterwards, that's a simple moment. And that was a trade out. There's no cost to the company. So it's like, yeah. what are you doing those simple moments? So give it a few more. I love the Circus of Light. Like, what is your company? To? What stories have you built to create these wow moments? Don't just say, oh, we care for our customers. Give stories to back it up. So these human truths that we're talking about, can you give us some examples on, I know you talk about belong and feel loved and meaning and respected, but what are some of them that the companies have done to show this? Well, Jesse, the one that I've been spending the most time on these days is this idea of belonging. Hmm. And it's a fascinating idea because when you look at these constant human truths, the things that our friends, our neighbors, our customers, they're just crying out for, number one is belonging. We have a belonging crisis in our world. We think we are a click away from a conversation or a friend, but what the research shows is that the more time people spend on social media and the internet, the lonelier they are. And the rates of depression, isolation, and even suicide are going up to crisis levels. Mm. And this sounds like a joke, but it's not. It's reached such a critical phase that the UK government has created a position, the Ministry of Loneliness. That's the crisis that we're in. Mm. Now, so this is a basic human truth. It's a, it's a basic human need. People need to belong. So on each of these ideas... I spend a chapter exploring what's the role of business in creating this validation, this love, this respect, this acknowledgement. What about belonging? And I approached this very skeptically because I thought you might feel like you belong 
to a church yep. or a sports team or an alumni association, but can you really belong to a company? And I think the whole idea of like social media community is way overblown. But when I got into it, Jesse, I found that you can make people feel like they belong. And it's this huge unmet need out there. And I think it's really happening. I mean, I think that there is an opportunity for businesses and it's not easy. That's the common theme of all of this. And you know this firsthand. It's easy to take out an ad. You take money and you wait for something to happen. It's hard to go out and make a deal with your friends at the car wash and organize this thing so that these cars are being washed and everybody's happy. You've got to roll up your sleeves and you've got to go out and do the work. Yes. The search for the marketing easy button is over. It's over. And we've got to get out of our technology and back into the sorts of things that you're doing. And if you do that, it is possible to create this sense of belonging. And I love it. I think, are people willing to wear your logo proudly? And yes. it's very easy from a sports team. Yes, the bananas, but like Yeti, like they're yeah. a cooler Isn't that company. A crazy example. They're a cooler company. They're coolers for Pete's sake. And thousands of people are wearing their hats, they're wearing their stickers because I think belonging has a big sense of pride. And I think not Absolutely. only do we all want to belong, we want to feel pride and proud in what we're a part of. And Yeti is a great example. What other ones are there out there? So companies can say, all right, and how did Yeti do it? I mean, that's a whole other story. But do you have any other examples of companies we may not be too familiar with that are creating the sense of belonging? Because it's so important. It's super important. And here's a little experiment that I did. I want your listeners to start to pay attention to this. All right. As you go around through your life, watch for, if you go into a coffee shop, look at people's computers and look at the stickers yes. that are on their computers. Yes. Look at the bumper stickers that might be on somebody's car. They don't do that in other parts of the world so much. That's kind of a fun thing people do in America. If people are willing to put an emblem on their precious laptop computer or their precious automobile, that's like a symbol like, I believe, it's almost like getting a tattoo. Yes. It's like a digital virtual tattoo Correct. without the pain and the needles. <laughs> it's like you're displaying this emblem and saying, I believe in this organization so much. They are not going to let me down. I will permanently display this on my laptop. Those are companies that make people feel like they belong. So when I was writing the book, I went out to my friends and I said, what laptop stickers do you see the most? And that's how I got a lot of the awesome. ideas Love it. for the book. And one of them is one of my favorite stories in the book is Wissia. It's this little company up in Boston, and in terms of a tech company or a small company, they are just doing amazing things to help their customers feel like they belong. They bought, like, they have a Slack channel. They have a Slack, they're paying for a Slack membership for every single one of their customers, and, like, they're one click away from a personal response from somebody in the company. Love it. Another thing, Jesse, that I think is a very powerful thing is bringing people together. That was a theme. Of course, that's what you do for your living, but that's not a natural thing for yeah. many businesses. And when I was talking to a lot of these people in the case studies in the book, I kept hearing the same thing over and over again. People would say, everything changed when we brought people together. Because talk about how to make be the most human company when they see your face and hear your voice and hear your passion and see your smile and maybe give a handshake or a hug. It's the difference between listening to a song on the radio and going to a concert with your friends. That's an emotional experience you're never going to forget. So bringing people together and letting them see your humanity, letting them see how much you care, changes everything. And that's why, Mark, when I read your book, I was like, this is the textbook of the future. That means so much to me. Thank you so much. I was so fired up because it was something that needed to be said. And again, it is the hard way, but it's the right way. And to think about how do you make people feel every day. Yeah. And again, right. it's like, you know, thinking about how people belong and they're a part of something. You don't think, oh, I'm going to make someone feel belonging by I'm going to shoot them ads. I'm going to market them and I'm going to give them a cold call today to try to get right. them to buy the product that I want to sell, not the product that they want to buy. And I'm going to give them a pen at my trade show. <laughs> Who wants a pen? Yeah. It's unbelievable. I love it. And I think part of that, too, you talk about belonging. And the other one, too, I love is taking a stand. You talk about this. Well, that's, that's, that's a hard one. one. And it's a hard one because... I mean, controversial. I think, obviously, right. you, you talk about 
Kaepernick in there, which is extremely controversial. Obviously, yeah. politics are controversial. But taking a stand can simply mean, do you share who you are and what you stand for? For instance, we stand for more fun, more caring, and a better fans first experience for everyone. That's not politically incorrect, but we say it over and over again. Can you give some of the examples like taking a stand? I like Nike's too. Don't give me a hero. Make me a hero. That was really yeah. cool. Oh, I love that story. Yeah. Well, let me back up because this is a really important point. I don't want people to miss this. That one of the things that I showed in the research is that loyalty is in decline. Yes. And this came across in multiple research studies. But there was a clue in this report created by McKinsey. And they said the reason that loyalty is in decline is because the emotion is gone. Because people are just getting on their smartphones, flipping around, looking for a pair of shoes. And who's loyalty for? It's actually the company setting up to make them loyal. It's not like loyalty is built from the customer, not from the employer. Right. So there was an article published in the Harvard Business Review a few years ago that examined all these different things that we think contributes to loyalty. And what they found was that they didn't. They really didn't, like customer engagement, customer impressions. The only thing they found that created a connection to loyalty was shared values, Mm. shared meaning. And so if you take a stand for something that other people believe in, They will defend you to the end. They will stand by you, and they will even pay more for your products if they think we're aligned with them on values. Now, you mentioned the Colin Kaepernick example with Nike. Look, that was a very risky thing to do, but Nike had tons of research. They ran the numbers. They knew their customers very well. And look, there aren't too many marketing jobs out there that have a job description that say, you know, we want people to burn our product in the streets. <laughs> That's what happened when they took that stand. Mm. But it doesn't have to be controversial. Yes. And if you want a great example, I'd encourage your listeners to go on to YouTube and do a search for a video called Worlds Apart. Worlds Apart. It's a video created by Heineken that like brings a tear to my eye every time I see it. And it's a video that it's unifying. And it taps into a great emotion around connecting to people who are different from us. That's a great example where it doesn't have to be political. It doesn't have to be polarizing. You can create content that's wholesome and unifying. Well, you also gave a great example on your presentation at Social Media Marketing World about the company, all the people and the mountains climbing. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's one of my favorites, too. That's the North Face video. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. What was the first comment? That's how you make an ad? Yeah, it was a video created by editing together user-generated content. Yes. So the customer was the marketer. Yes. It gets back to this idea of belonging, right? Because yes. the people who are doing these extreme sports, they're on the fringes of society. You know, they're climbing up these rock faces and they're doing, they're riding their mountain bikes over glaciers and all this stuff. And, you know, North Face made this video that said, hey, you're not crazy. You do belong. And you belong to us. You're our people. Thanks for bringing that up. It's one of my favorite examples of really appealing to these constant human truth, this constant human need of belonging in a beautiful way. It was so powerful. And I think a couple other things I want to get in some games with you because we get in games in this. So just be mentally prepared. One of the things, too, I think showing people behind the brand. This is what happened. You mentioned Wistia and how they actually film everything. Me and Jared, our president, were blown away by this. Then we also realized there are video companies. That makes even more sense. But then here's what we took from you, Mark. We left social media marketing world. We came back to the staff. We said, guys, we're going to start showing you guys, all of you, because people buy from us. They don't just buy from the bananas. And we started doing Facebook Live every day at noon, Monday through Friday. And we've done that now for two, going into three months. And our people found a part of it. People tune in, and it's become a real connector. Share briefly about, like, How other ways people can show the people behind the brand? I love what you're doing. So let me give you an example that I think will really sort of connect with people. So Tesla as a company has only been around for 10 years. They have a higher market value than Ford Motor Company. Now, I think part of that is that people love Elon Musk. And he is sort of controversial in some ways, but he's real. I mean, sometimes he makes mistakes and sometimes he says things he shouldn't say, but he's an engineer, thinks like an engineer, and he talks like an engineer. 
And I think people can relate to that, and they love him. I mean, the first time I ever saw him speak, I was just entranced, and I thought, that is a person I would work for. Mm -hmm. Now, who's the person that you love at Ford? Who's the person that you love at Chevy? Mm -hmm. Who's the person that you love at AT AT&T? We can't create an emotional connection to a logo Mm -hmm. or a jingle or an ad or branded content, whatever that's supposed to be. We can only really create emotional connections to people. And increasingly, the personal brand is the company brand. We love the people. So I think your instinct is is correct. I mean, they might love to go to the bananas games because it's fun and it's entertaining. But that real emotional bond is going to come from showing the people who are behind the scenes. Yeah. To say, look, I know the ticket person. I know this person because I watch them on Facebook Live and they do this and they do this and they love gardening and I love gardening. And that's what really builds the emotional connection beyond because that makes it beyond a gimmick. 100%. It turns into love. Yes. And that's as powerful as it gets. And you made the yeah. example. You said, I spoke in front of 5,000 CEOs and I asked how many of you guys have actually gone out and met with one of your customers, sat down with one of your customers, had lunch yeah. with one of your customers. And you said it was about 20 people. Is that correct? 19 people. 19 people. And what's amazing is I shared that with our staff and we've started this thing one fan a day. And our director of tickets kind of champion it, which is great when your people champion it. Every day, he will reach out, handwritten letter, video, thank you to them. And then he'll have at least one lunch a week with one of our customers. Like that's an investment that you should make. Stop thinking about putting $1,000 in here, $1,000 here. Invest in that lunch, that $40 lunch a week. Like it seems so well, simple. let's use you and me as a case study. I was sort of like vaguely aware of you. And then I got a handwritten note thanking me for writing the book. And I thought, well, who the heck is this guy? And then I started looking at figuring, trying to figure out who you were and what you did. And I thought, well, my goodness, that's really an interesting business. And then we met at Social Media Marketing World. So now there's that human connection. We wrote an article about you for my blog, which is one of the top five marketing blogs in the world. That was nice for you. Now we're creating content together. And before we push the record button, we were talking about other ways that you and I might be doing business together. That started with a handwritten note, period. Never would have happened without a handwritten note. And you and I, we're getting to know each other, we're becoming friends, and you never know where that will lead. 100%. Well, I think everyone should let someone know if they've made an impact in their life. And I remember very vividly when I was young and some people let me know that made the world because we all need that. And Amar, because yeah. you know, that the higher we grow up and as influencers, a big time author, speaker, it becomes more lonelier at the top. And those yeah, emails- absolutely. Those calls, those videos, those lunches, those dinners mean the world. And so I realize that. So I want to make sure other authors, other people feel that as well because I know it means the world to me. So thank you for acknowledging that. All right. We're going to have some fun to finish up here. A couple of rapid fire. First, a game. Okay. Now you talk about making people feel like they are a part of something and belong. This is one of the things we do at our stadium. We have 4,000 games. All right. Well, good. Everyone is. It's fun. We have 4,000 people sing. It's called our sing-off, sing in the blank. We have 2,000 people on one grandstand sing against 2,000 people in the other grandstand. This song, you know, my friend. And all you got to do is when the song stops, you got to finish that song lyric. And if you're the worst singer in the world, that's perfect. No one's been good at this. This is <laughs> right. a sing-off. All right? And all so right. you should know this one, my friend. All right, here we go. <laughs> Revolution. <laughs> Perfect. You, all you had to say was one word. So you just Cause won. Because that's, that's all I know. I'm terrible. <laughs> I have this mental defect around. It's a disability. I cannot remember lyrics. <laughs> I can usually remember the refrain. It's ridiculous. Well, I can't sing any song. I know <laughs> Happy Birthday and the Mr. Rogers song, It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, because I heard it 10,000 times as a child. Well, Other than that, that's about it. Well, so you nailed I'm glad it. I passed your game. You passed the game. Usually we'll have like pour some sugar on me, living on a prayer, and it's the wild. But I kept Revolution because I think you came out to that song or you finished your talk with that song. Is that correct? No, it was Rebel Rebel. Rebel Rebel. I was, all right, in my head, that's what I was saying. Yeah. It was all about the rebellion. Ah, all right, cool. I love it. I love it. But again, I think you talked about that. We're doing a rebellion and a revolution. You've talked about that before. I mean, a rebellion is a little more aggressive, but it is a revolution too. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I love it. All right, marketing minute. Marketing minute. You have done so much to grow your brand. Known was one of my favorites too. I could show you that in our bookshelf. Every page is earmarked. What is the best thing that you've done to grow your brand? The best thing I did to grow my brand was to have the courage to add my story to the business. Mm. And look, I'm the old school. I'm the old guard. I grew up in the days when the companies were in control and the companies controlled the brand. And when I started my business, I didn't even have my picture on my website. And over time, I started blogging 10 years ago and I thought, I am going to present my marketing message to my ideal personas. So that's the way I started blogging. And two things happened. First of all, nothing happened. <laughs> Second of all, I just got bored. And so I started to relax and I started to have more fun. And I decided if I feel funny today, I'm going to be funny. If I feel mad about something today or confused, I'm going to talk about it. And I took these little risks of like opening up the curtains to show me and my world and my life. Today on Instagram, I was out power washing my deck and I was sweaty and grungy. I just wanted to show people because I think a lot of people put me up on a pedestal because I speak at these big things and I wrote these books, but I'm just a person like everybody else. I want to show that all the time. Look, I'm just a person like you. Today, I'm out power washing my deck. It's one of my superpowers. <laughs> I and it. yeah, so the biggest thing I did was just like tear down the corporate curtains and have the courage to show yourself, to show your humanity, because that's how people connect with you. It's the only way you can be original. You have no choice. There's nobody like you. So you've got to express your personality. And every leader should do that. I don't care if they think they're an introvert. They need to get yeah. out and start showing themselves. All right, first step. I'm making up this game. I'm calling this game first step. We just talked about a lot of ideas. What's yeah. the first step for a business to start getting the customers to do the marketing? To start this rebellion? Well, the thing that we talked about earlier is step number one is stop doing what people hate. Like <laughs> robocalls, right? Since when is calling people good business? Robocalls. Direct mail that's just littering mailboxes and spam and lead nurturing and all this stuff. But then after that, I think you need to have some reflection and you have to be able to finish this sentence. Only we. It's a really hard sentence for any business to finish. But if you can finish that sentence and you can't get something lame like only we have great customer service, eh, eh, right? That could be your garbage man. That could be the people who bring you your mail. No, it's got to be what is it about you that people love and talk about? What drives your competitors crazy? What's distinctive about you? And if you know that, you'll know the story. You'll know the story to tell. You'll know where to tell it. You'll know who to tell it to. It sort of like unveils your marketing plan. And it only isn't a little bit better, faster, quicker, cheaper. Only is distinct. It's different. We talk yeah. about that all the time. That's why we try to be the only team with break dancing first base coach, the only team with a male cheerleading team, the only team with dancing players. Like that's part of our concept. The only. What are you the only? I love it. Speaking the same language. All right. Another quick game. Flip the script, Mark. You are the host of Business Done Differently. You can ask me one question. Do you ever not wear a yellow suit? <laughs> I proposed in the yellow suit. She said yes in front of a sold-out crowd, but I wasn't allowed to get married in the yellow suit. It was all about Emily that night. Darn, that's good. The suit is my uniform. So I played yeah. baseball my whole life. When I put on my uniform, it's yeah. game time. When I put on the yellow that's suit, it's showtime. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Sundays, I take it off. The other one, question time. What are some of the best questions you're asking people you're working with? What are some of the best questions I'm asking people that I'm working with? Well, I think that the one that we just talked oh, about is the sort of one that blows people's minds yeah. because nine times out of 10, they can't answer it. And if you can't finish that sentence, only we, you don't have a marketing plan. You may think you have a marketing plan, but you don't have a marketing plan. I mentioned earlier that I, you know, I studied under Peter Drucker. And one of the things he's famous for is the five questions. And these are the five questions you've got to ask to really realize what your business is about. And I sort of narrowed it down to one. And I'm not saying I'm smarter than Peter Drucker, but it at least gets people thinking in the right way is what makes us distinct. That's how business starts. I love it. 
All right, quick final four. What's one thing that you've done to stand out in business and in life? Courage. Writing this book took courage. <laughs> I mean, like you said, you said this is a book that needed to be written. It's, I said what needed to be said. There aren't too many people who would do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's I had a tremendous amount of trepidation writing this book because I thought a lot of traditional people were going to slam me. Which would and, be okay because you're standing for something. Right. I love it. It has to be said. So, I mean, I think that's kind of what I'm known for, really, is just having the courage to say what needs to be said. And reinventing, too, what you and, and doing it in a nice way, too. A hundred percent. All right. If you were to give advice to someone starting out in the business world, what would you give them? Start with marketing. Because I work with a lot of young people and a lot of startups, and this is the last thing they think about. Because they're in love with a the product, they're in love with a the service, they're in love with an idea. And if you don't have customers, you don't have a business. You've got to bake your marketing into your business plan from the very beginning. And if you need help, get help. A lot of people think, oh, it's do it yourself. I'll just get a blog post. I'll just do Facebook. Marketing today is harder than it's ever been. I've been in marketing nearly 40 years. <laughs> today, this day, marketing is harder than it's ever been. Final two quickly. It's the best advice you've received? Because I know you've Peter Drucker, you've had a lot yeah. of people around you. What's the best advice you received? Best advice I ever received was I was a young guy growing up in the corporate world and I was full of piss and vinegar and I was going up the corporate ladder and I was conquering the world and I was getting promoted, promoted, promoted. And I was like, I was just stressed all the time. And I went into this training program and I got this master's degree in applied behavioral sciences. And one of the mentors in the program became a great life mentor to me. He was trying to sort of like get under my skin and have me sort of like shed my corporate armor. And he said, what's the emotion you feel most of the time? And I said, anxiety. Of course, I'm in this stupid program. That causes me anxiety just being in this stupid program. I didn't say those words exactly. Yeah, that yeah. was what was in my head. So I was kind of being a smart aleck. And I said, so what's the emotion you feel most of the time? And without hesitation, he said, joy. And I knew it was true because this guy was a joyful man. One word changed my life. Because I thought, you know what? I want to be like that. I need to make more decisions that lead to joy. Because I'm making this assumption that to do what I do, it has to be stressful and it has to create anxiety in my life. And so I need to make, start making different decisions. That was literally a moment and one word that changed my life. So profound. Make more decisions that lead to joy. Love it. Yeah. Final question here. How do you want to be remembered? Ah, oh, boy, that's a hard one. I think one of the things that is such a blessing to me and such a reward in my life is that Every single week, someone tells me, you changed my life. And there's not many people in the world that can experience that. I mean, it's wild. I've built this platform where people listen to me and they trust me. And I've got an opportunity to be a good role model. I've got an opportunity to show people that you can lead with your heart and we don't need to have this toxic world. That we can lift each other up, we can help each other, we can be positive. You know, the world is so toxic and the internet is such a cesspool in so many ways. But the place where I live on the internet is not. It's positive. It's uplifting. It's filled with hope. So that's what I want to bring to my little part of the world. I mean, I can't solve world hunger, but at least in my little world, for my audience, I want it to be a positive place of hope. Well, you're doing that. And you are changing people's lives. So Mark, like I said, in a little small way, from first reading known to being blown away by Marketing Rebellion to meeting you, you've made an impact here and on everyone we touch. And I think that's what's amazing. It's this domino effect. When we are sharing what we learn with others, it spreads and it's contagious. And you've done an amazing job of that. And thanks today so much for sharing with the listeners. And where can people learn more and connect? Because you've got so much to share, my friend. Well, it's easy to find me. I figured early in my career that nobody could learn how to spell Schaefer. There's so many ways to spell it. So Schaefer.com was out of the question. I thought that people could probably remember Businesses Grow. Businessesgrow.com is my website. You can find my blog, my podcast, my books, my social media connections, and I'd love to keep in touch with your 
listeners and learn more about them and what they're doing in their lives. Outstanding. Well, thank you so much, Mark. You are a rock star today, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Business Done Differently with Jesse Cole, the Yellow Tux Guy. If you love the show, let Jesse know by leaving a review on iTunes or sending him an email at jesse at findyouryellowtux.com. For more information on the guest and topics of this episode, visit findyouryellowtux.com. Until next time, stop standing still, start standing out.